Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the stunning Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts. I want to acknowledge our presence on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, and I am fortunate that in my professional role, it enables me to work regularly with Indigenous scholars from whom I learn every day about Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon to welcome you to this truly exciting and unique discussion. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Kimberly Woodhouse and I am the Vice Principal of Research for Queen's University. It is wonderful to see so many students, faculty, and community members present for today's sold out event. Thank you to those who have traveled far to be with us, including those from Ottawa, Toronto, New York, London, and I believe Sweden, um, and hello to all of, the, of you who are joining us via the live stream of the event, and we are glad that you are with us today. Today, Queen's has the pleasure of being the host university for the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative one of only four stops on its first Canadian tour. Queen's and the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative sh share similar mandates, namely to promote research excellence, to inspire the next generation of scholars and scientists, and to build dialogue and synergies amongst the global research community. Today we are honored to be joined by not one, but two Nobel laureates, Drs. Chaffley and MacDonald. We also wel welcome Canada's Chief Science Advisor, Dr. Mona Niemer, and award-winning health reporter and author, Andre Picard. These research and thought leaders will engage us in an inspiring dialogue on issues of critical importance to the research landscape in Canada and internationally. As one of Canada's leading research intensive universities, we are no stranger to the research journey. We know it's often not a straight road, but one with many detours, alternative routes, and one that sometimes takes us to unexpected places. Regardless of the results, it's the learnings from the journey that fuel us to move forward and continue to make valuable contributions. I hope today inspires you in your own research journey. I'd like to introduce a few special guests who will bring greetings and some context to today's discussion. In speaking order, they are Dr. Principal, Dr. Patrick Dean, Principal and Vice Chancellor of Queen's University, Dr. Adam Smith, Chief Science Officer, Nobel Media, Dr. Neil Moreski, Vice President, Science Affairs at AstraZeneca Canada, and finally, Dr. Richard Resnick, Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's, who will introduce our moderator and first panelist. Thank you again, and I hope you enjoy today's event. Now please join me in welcoming Principal Dean to the podium. Thank you very much, Dr. Woodhouse, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, this is a very special occasion in the life of the university, uh, and a great pleasure to be here. Uh, today, as you heard uh, from Dr. Woodhouse, we're here to explore the research journey, uh, to understand a little more about it, and to understand, in particular, what it takes to achieve success, success of the highest level. This is a very important dis uh, discussion, and I'm delighted that our university is able to host it and to welcome you all here today. Uh, it's an honor, in fact, to host the Nobel Inspiration Initiative, and it's exciting to reflect that among you today, here in the audience and also those watching uh, the live stream, in that group, we have potential future Nobel Prize laureates who will be responsible for discoveries that will make our world a better place and improve the lives uh, of all our citizens around the globe. 
This speaks to the central mission of universities. They do exist at a, funda at a fundamental level to serve the greater good of humanity and of the world we inhabit. And that happens in many ways. Obviously, it occurs through the education of young citizens. Uh, but perhaps the most important way in which uh, it happens is through research. At Queen's, we believe in the fundamental value of research. And we want to create an environment where researchers can push boundaries, where they can test limits, importantly, where they can fail safely and take risks to achieve the kind of success that we are talking about today. The course to these kinds of achievements is really even and without obstacle. I'm also very proud that we have many exceptional people working here at Queen's, some of the world's best scholars and faculty working in a wide range of fields. We want to ignite curiosity and the excitement of discovery throughout our entire institution. But I also believe that research is not just the realm for graduate and postdoctoral researchers and faculty, but it is an important activity for all, and that includes undergraduate students and even younger researchers, like the high school students we have in the audience today, and I welcome them in particular. Curiosity is exciting and transformative for people of all ages, and the impact will always be far felt. Before I wrap up, I want to mention that we're very pleased to have a new research promotion website that is focused on sharing the work that is happening here at Queen's. Uh, the point of the website is to tell the stories behind the research and to celebrate the various journeys uh, that have led to the achievements recorded there. It's very important to highlight those stories so that everyone understands how research affects their life and helps shape our collective knowledge about the world we live in. So thank you all for being here. I hope when it's all over you will leave feeling inspired and that you will share that inspiration with fellow students, colleagues, and friends that in the best interests of us all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Adam Smith from Nobel Media, which is the outreach arm of the Nobel Foundation based in Stockholm, Sweden. And on behalf of all at Nobel Media, I want to welcome you to the event, which, as you've heard, is part of the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative. That's a global program that we run together with AstraZeneca, and its mission is terribly simple. We just take Nobel laureates around the world to meet the next generation of researchers. We've been running it for 10 years, and we've been all over the world. We've been to Japan and Korea and China and India and Russia and lots of places in Europe and Brazil and the US, but oddly, as Dr. Woodhouse said, we've never been to Canada before. I'm very pleased to be making up for that omission today. I'd like to thank Queen's University, Dr. Woodhouse, uh, for so kindly hosting us. It's really exciting to be here. And it's really exciting to see all of you. This is exactly what the initiative is all about. A huge audience, lots of young faces. I'd like to show Stockholm what we're achieving here by taking a photograph of you all. <laughs> so, I guess the appropriate thing to say would be Nobel Prize, sir. Did you say Nobel Prize? Nobel Prize. Thank you. <laughs> so, the audience is half of the, of the formula for a good session. The panelists are the other half, and I'd like to thank Marty Chalfi, uh, Art MacDonald, Mona Nima, and Andre Picard for taking the time out of their schedules to be with us this afternoon. We're in for a really exciting discussion, and I think it's going to be very thought-provoking and, yes, inspirational. So I wish you all a very exciting afternoon, and I'd like to hand over to Neil from AstraZeneca, please. Thank you, Adam, and good afternoon to you all. I'm Neil Mareski, and I lead scientific affairs at AstraZeneca Canada. Dr. Chalfi, we are so proud to be hosting you here today in Kingston. And as everybody in the room knows, science can change the world, and every step forward 
continues to open up new and exciting possibilities. Throughout my career as a physician and as a researcher, I've had first-hand experience on the impact that science has on patients and on societies in general. And I believe now, more than ever, especially what I see sometimes on social media, that the pursuit of scientific inquiry and discovery is key to some of solving some of society's biggest challenges. And at AstraZeneca, science is at the core of what we do. We continue to push the boundaries of science to deliver life-changing medications. We invest in research in Canada and around the world in three main therapeutic areas, in respiratory, in cardiovascular metabolism, and in oncology. And we are especially proud of the relationship that we have developed over the last few years with Queen's University, especially the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, the CCTG, where we have invested hugely in global and local clinical trials that ultimately will deliver life-changing medicines to patients who suffer from cancer. Dr. Chalfi, you too continue to push the boundaries of science, and we are grateful to you for your sharing your insights and knowledge today as you inspire the next generation of Canadian researchers. And to all of you in the audience, the aspiring scientists in the audience, and online, thank you for joining us today. You are the future of science, of science in our country, and I really can't wait to see where the future takes us. So on that note, I'd like to hand it over to my friend, the Dean of Health Sciences, Richard Resnick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Resnick, Dean of Health Sciences, and it's a pleasure to be here and part of this special, unique event. I uh, want to say thanks to uh, Neil Moreski, who you just heard from AstraZeneca. Uh, Neil, I'm delighted that we as partners across the university saw the opportunity to host this important national dialogue as part of the Nobel Inspiration Initiative's first Canadian tour and to highlight our interests in advancing uh, research uh, excellence. I think we're all in for a terrific treat. Um, and now for the reason you're here, I'm pleased to introduce uh, uh, Andre Picard and Martin Chalfi. Um, you may already know of Andre uh, for his role as a preeminent health reporter and colonist for the Globe and Mail, where he's been staff writer for the last, uh, I think, 32 years. Um, he's also the author of five uh, best-selling books and received many awards for journalism, uh, a champion of the Canadian, true champion of the Canadian health system, uh, Andre Zwan, uh, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his dedication to improving health care in our country. Uh, Mr. Picard will serve as our moderator today and he'll begin today's event with a discussion with Martin Chalfi, uh, the 2008 Nobel uh, Prize Laureate in Chemistry. Uh, thanks to the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative, we have the great pleasure of welcoming you, Marty, uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Chalfi is a university professor at Columbia. Uh, having earned his BA and PhD from Harvard, uh, Martin went on to do postdoctoral research at Cambridge before uh, moving to Columbia. Something you may not know about uh, Dr. Chalfi is that when he started at Harvard, he initially intended to study mathematics, but soon switched to uh, biochemistry. Uh, and often those forks in the road, especially those less traveled by, as Frost would say, make all the difference. Um, his lifetime of research has been directed towards answering two important biological questions. How do different types of nerve cells acquire and maintain their unique characteristics? And how do sensory cells respond to mechanical signals? Dr. Chalfi was recognized for his work uh, by the Nobel Institute, and he shared the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his introduction of green fluorescent protein as a biological mar uh, marker. Uh, following his discussion with uh, Dr. Chalfi, Mr. Picard will then invite two very special individuals to join them on stage, Dr. Art McDonnell, our own Nobel laureate uh, at Queen's, and Dr. Mona Niemer, Canada's chief scientific advisor. The Faculty of Health Sciences' vision is that we ask questions, 
we seek answers, we advance care, and I think, uh, uh, Dr. Dean, you wrote this, inspire change. Uh, and all our panelists today are true examples of what that vision looks like when it's put into action. It's an honor for us to have them today, and I hope as you listen and engage, you too are inspired to do great things in your careers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andre Picard and Martin Chalfi to the podium. Well, thank you all for that uh, kind introductions and uh, Welcome to Canada, welcome to Queens. Yeah, they told us uh, they build it online as an intimate discussion, so I'm gonna so snuggle up. <laughs> so I wanna start, I wanna start with the million dollar question, the question you get asked at every event. How do you win a Nobel Prize? So the, the answer is I have no idea. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I have proof <laughs> that no one else does either, or hardly anyone else does. The prize is a wonderful thing to get. It's indescribable almost uh, and I think that everyone that gets it really likes the attention and <laughs> the honor and everything else that goes with it and I think they all secretly go home after the ceremony and say to themselves I want another <laughs> but they don't <laughs> and so we don't have a clue <laughs> what we did but I think that the thing that's really important about the Nobel is that it doesn't go to the smartest scientists. There are smart scientists that get it. Doesn't go to the most productive. Doesn't go to the one with the biggest group or the most papers in this journal or that. It goes, in my opinion, to scientists that did something that changed the way we do science or we think about the world. And it's very hard to come up with something that does that. Many of us stumble in on it. And then we notice it enough to want to do more work and bring it to the attention of others. So I think it's very hard to actually say, I'm going to win a Nobel Prize, and this is how I'm going to do it. So let me ask a variation on that for all the people who won't win a Nobel Prize. How do you have a, a long, satisfying career in science? Well, in all honesty, people don't, I, I believe, most people don't stay up night saying, am I going to get a prize? The reward uh, for many of us is the discovery. It's not but the recognition later, it's just being able to say, I looked at an aspect of the world and I found something that no one else previously knew about. It's sort of cool to be the, one, the first person in the world to do that. That's one of the rewards of this. And I think that's a, a very important aspect of it. It's being able to grapple with a problem to push that boundary of our understanding and be able to go push it just a little bit further than it was before, uh, that's, I think, the reward most of us really enjoy, not the papers and the awards and stuff, but uh, making those discoveries. So we have an audience, quite a mixed audience, lay people, researchers, scientists, students. Uh, can we explain to them in lay terms what, what your research was? You're that one person in the world that did it. My, my understanding is you work with transparent worms and uh, uh, proteins that light up in, in the dark. Uh, how can you explain it in lay terms? Let me try. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's actually pretty easy. Uh, I, I am the world's expert on tickling worms. <laughs> I, I work on a very tiny worm, and I try to understand how the nerve cells sense touch. Do you have a very tiny feather? Uh, it's, it, actually, it's an eyebrow hair glued to a toothpick. Excellent. And I tickle the animal, and normal animals move, and the ones that are insensitive, that are, have a mutation that prevents touch, they don't move. And we put them into politics. And Yes, <laughs> the insensitive ones. And in the course of the study, uh, we take the mutant animals and we try to find out what was the defect in the DNA. And that means we clone the genes. We get the DNA that was the important component, or coded for the important component. One of the very first questions that people that do molecular biology ask once they have a gene is, where did it work? 
our genes, we, every cell has all the collection of genes, but some, cell, some genes work in the kidneys, some genes work in the skin, some work in nerve cells. And so one of the things we want to do is ask, where does it work? And there had been ways to do this. But one day I heard a seminar about a wonderful protein that had been discovered uh, almost 28 years before by Osama Shimamura in jellyfish. And this protein had this amazing ability that it was fluorescent. Now lots of molecules are fluorescent, but this was a protein made by a living organism. And fluorescence means, in this case, blue light hits the molecule, green light comes out. So wherever that is, you could see where it is simply by saying, where's the blue, where do you see green? And as you mentioned before, I work on a transparent animal. This is great. I listened to the seminar. I ignored everything else that was said. I just thought about the experiment. What if I could put this protein into my, this, this animal? And it worked. We were able to put it in. And then we would be able to, wherever that gene was turned on, it would make this green fluorescent protein. And so we'd shine light and say, oh, that's the cell that makes it. That's the cell that makes it. These don't make it. That one makes it. The advantage of this is we're looking in a living organism. And once you can see something, you can study it. This is a fundamental of science. You can't see it. You can't work on it. But if you could see the cell, which we did, a nerve cell, and we have very simple nerve cells, we can mutate that animal that has the marked cell in it and ask questions like, can we find a mutant that doesn't have any cells or has more cells or have the cells in different places or grows out because it's a nerve cell in a completely new direction or more extensions that is normally seen because every one of those variants will tell us about those biological processes. And what's happened is that people working in many, many different organisms have used this idea. If you can mark something, if you can see it, you can study it. So people have taken tumors in mice and put GFP, green fluorescent protein, into the tumor cells, put the tumor cells in mice and asked, where do these metastasize? Where does it go? How is the AIDS virus, HIV, how is that, how does that transmit it from one infected cell to another? Well, it's hard to see something going, but if it's got its own flag that it's waving at you, you can see it. And that's what GFP is. It's a way of watching biology happen. I and hope you all understood that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. And you didn't set out to do this, but it had practical applications in cancer research, in AIDS, many other areas. Yes, I mean, it, this started as uh, a, uh, I thought we were going to be able to, use, uh, to develop a very useful tool. Uh, I had several ideas about what I wanted to use that tool from. I have been amazed over the years, it's been now almost exactly 25 years since we introduced uh, this molecule as a marker, at how many different ideas have come from it and the different uh, ramifications. And the ramifications have gone in many, many different ways. There's been more basic research. There's been more applied research. I, soon after my Nobel, I, was, I gave a talk to a board. And one of the people on the board was the head of Zeiss Microscopes in the United States. And he came up afterwards and he said, you don't know this, but before your paper came out, the Zeiss company was thinking of stopping making fluorescent microscopes. <laughs> Your paper came out, suddenly everyone wanted a fluorescent microscope, <laughs> so I want to thank you for uh, helping our business. So I asked him for a microscope, I didn't get it, but, uh, it, it was nice. but, but that was not part of the implications. Uh, the uh, writer or film producer, Ang Lee, Use GFP, this ability to have tissue be made green. He used it as the basis to explain why the Hulk yeah. is green in his movie. <laughs> I wouldn't have predicted that. <laughs> but does it matter if research has commercial applications, or that it makes a Hulk movie eventually, or does it matter? Is it research for the sake of research sometimes? 
I think that scientists in general always think about the implications of their work. What would happen if I did this? What, is this an important experiment if, since we all have many different things we could do? And, but we can't predict all of these things, but in the development of methods and development of ideas, uh, we often develop things that then have another consequence. So I think we have an immediate consequence of what we're doing. We want to be able to follow where genes were turned on in cells, but there was much more that came out of it. Just as the development of the laser, that was not started because doctors said, we want to have a thing for microsurgery, or grocery store owners didn't come to the people developing the laser and say, you know, we really need to be able to scan those cans of vegetables <laughs> as it comes through the, the thing, or any of these things, or uh, all the other things. And they didn't predict all the wonderful basic discoveries that were the basis of Nobel, further Nobel Prizes that absolutely required the, uh, the invention of the lasers. Most recent being laser tweezers, mm -hmm. but before that, gravity waves, ultra-low temperatures, lots of different things that required the laser. So basic research gives rise to basic research, applied, and some, like in the Hulk case, truly <laughs> bizarre things that come up <laughs> that you never predict. Now, the audience can tell by now you're very passionate about science, about your work. Where, where did this passion come from? Was there something in school? Uh, I always like to do a shout out to teachers, but is there something, what, what inspired you to get interested in science? Uh, when I was growing up, I was interested in science. I seemed to have a little bit of an aptitude for it. I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, I did fairly well in school in it. And uh, I sort of thought I would be on a path to be a scientist. I worked in a lab when I was, after my junior year in college, to get some experience. And boy, did I get experience. <laughs> I failed completely the entire <laughs> summer. Nothing worked. And I took this as a sign, and I quit. I said, that's it, I'm never gonna be a scientist. I went off after I graduated and took a whole series of different jobs. I was a janitor, dress salesman, set up rock concerts in the parks of Cambridge, Massachusetts. A whole bunch of the usual jobs people do. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I wound up teaching in high school. And uh, I found out that you had, Teachers have to find a job over the summer. So I <laughs> was able to get a job working in a laboratory. I had an idea. I didn't tell the boss about it. I just did it. But he went away for a while, so that was okay. <laughs> and the experiment worked. I had a lot of help with people telling me how to do the experiment. But it worked. And that was so exciting. I said, eh, maybe I should try this. This is, this is not a bad thing to do. So when it works, you feel pretty happy. It doesn't work, and that's what happened. <laughs> now, the, the, the name of our seminar today, they've given it a lofty title, Failure, Persistence, and Joy. Now, you've won a Nobel Prize, so should I assume you've never failed? Well, I just said I failed miserably. <laughs> and I, I also want to say something, because the second word in this title is persistence. Mm -hmm. If you listen to what I just said, I failed <laughs> and I quit. <laughs> Okay, so there, there, there's no persistence. I, I'm not a role model here. That's not the thing to think about. Um, I was very fortunate to get back into it. Uh, I, I've, my life has sort of been a random walk, I think, for the most part. But I, I, I think that one of the, I, there were many problems for that failure. I didn't have anyone really talking to me about it. I didn't, ask, I didn't feel I should ask people for help which I think was a big mistake. Uh, I didn't have people telling me, you know, the first time you do things, you're gonna fail. It's, it's, it's doing, so I didn't have sort of the support that I had much later in, in this story than I did at first. So the persistence, I, I think, is, has to be coupled with mentorship and help, and I, I was very fortunate I had a spectacular, the, the person I worked with to do this experiment was very supportive of that, helped me get into graduate school. The person who was my mentor in graduate school, Bob Perlman, was just a, is a lovely, lovely man who helped me. Uh, and I got a lot of assistance from that. There were good people all the way along. 
And at different stages, I got different types of help. So in my postdoc, I had lots of colleagues to talk to, but the person I actually did my postdoc with, who won his Nobel Prize in 2002, Sidney Brenner, he was doing something else. He wanted me to be completely independent. And that was a wonderful bit of training for me to make the decisions about my experiments and stuff. So it's all a mix, I think. Great. Now, you used the word help, so I'm going to invite a couple of other people up here on stage to help us out with the conversation. So I want to introduce, uh, very briefly, and I won't do their bios justice or else we won't have, uh, we'll be here till dinner, but I want to invite uh, uh, Mona Niemer, Canada's Chief Science Advisor. Uh, her job is to provide uh, related advice related to science, uh, to government policies. And prior to that, she's, uh, among uh, many things she's done, Vice President of Research at the University of Ottawa. And Dr. Niemer's specialty is molecular cardiology, uh, helping out young children with cardiac problems through molecular uh, testing. And she also has received a number of prestigious awards that I won't list, but one of them is a uh, member of the Order of Canada. So if you'd like to join us, Mona, that'd be great. And uh, yeah. And of course, someone who needs no introduction at Queen's, uh, Art McDonald, a professor emeritus in the Department of Physics, Engineering, Physics, uh, Engineering, Physics and Astronomy uh, here, and uh, director of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Among his many, many awards, he's a companion of the Order of Canada, and of course, a co-recipient of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, Dr. McDonald's research focuses on neutrinos and dark matter. I think they made a Hulk movie about dark matter too, so I'll <laughs> we'll invite him up to join us. And thank you all. What a, I'm very flattered to be with such uh, great brains up here. Uh, thankfully, I have, have my questions written out. So, uh, Art, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, all of you on the panel, you've all done basic research. Uh, your findings have had clinical, practical applications. Some don't. I'm wondering, does it matter? Does it matter that research has foreseeable applications, commercial applications? I don't think it matters uh, in the sense that uh, if one really can make an advance in basic science, there usually is a, uh, a response to that in terms of its applicability in, the, uh, uh, in, in applied ways and benefits to humanity. Uh, one of the uh, examples I like to give is uh, uh, someone that has become famous, of course, and that is Albert Einstein, who was chosen by Time magazine as the person of the 20th century, and he had no idea uh, that uh, in the process of understanding the things he did in relativity and uh, uh, quantum physics and so on, that he would spawn the set of technological developments, including the laser that uh, Marty mentioned earlier on, that were really transformative. And they include, I mean, you may not know it, but uh, in order for the GPS that you have in your phone or as a separate unit to be so accurate, you have to make general relativistic corrections to that in order to get the final bit of accuracy. So uh, I think even though Einstein's work was very basic, it eventually had its applications. And I wore my Einstein socks in his honor today. So. All right. Uh, and I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked uh, Marty. Tell us a little about, in lay terms, about your research that won a Nobel Prize. Neutrinos, dark matter, that sounds all very complicated. Well, um, yes, uh, but it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, most people don't have uh, much knowledge of neutrinos. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they very seldom interact with, with anything. For them, an atom is open space because they only hit, only if they hit the nucleus or an electron head on do they have any interaction. They can pass through the distance that light travels in a year of lead with only a 50% chance. That's great when it comes to trying to learn about the properties of the sun, which is one of the things we did, by, because they penetrate out of the sun with no problem. And they also penetrate through the two kilometers of rock above our uh, experiment, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, and now Snow Lab. Uh, and everything else uh, from the cosmic rays basically is shielded out. Uh, but by studying neutrinos, and we studied one an hour with a detector the size of a 10-story building, uh, we were able to measure how the sun burns with great accuracy. And also new, learn new properties of the neutrinos themselves that uh, have spawned a whole area of study of particle physics. Uh, 
Fermilab, the major uh, uh, accelerator laboratory in the United States, basically does nothing but neutrino physics these days. They create neutrino beams that are used for studying things. And uh, uh, that's an indication of the fact that we knew very little about neutrinos and we're learning a tremendous amount as a result of under having understood the sorts of things for which the Nobel Prize was awarded to the Snow Collaboration, which I was fortunate to lead, and also uh, a Japanese collaboration that studied other properties. Great. So, thank you. So, Mona, I want to bring you in on that. I know I keep coming back to this question, but I think it's one we hear a lot uh, in public. This, how do we get this balance right between basic, applied, uh, targeted research? What's the difference, and you know, does it matter? Well, you know, I always say that uh, there's, th there's no difference between uh, research except excellence. So you can either do good research or bad research, whether it's applied or whether it's basic, uh, basic science. And uh, I agree with, uh, with Art. I think that basic research always ends up having applications. It's a matter of when. And sometimes you need to have convergence from different fields uh, for things to happen. And I give the example of biotechnology, where you had to have the conversion of advances in microbiology, bacteriology, but also in, uh, in, in chemistry. Uh, you could synthesize DNA. And by the way, I was doing my PhD at the time, uh, and my uh, PhD supervisor almost lost his grant because people said, who will ever need to have synthetic DNA? <laughs> so I think you know, it's, uh, we have to be you know, conscious of this. This being said, um, I think that at, uh, when the time is right and the two, um, the, the two or different fields are converging, I think it's, um, it's important also that we facilitate, um, you know, for, for us exploiting these applications for, for, for the public good, whether it is for, you know, better policies, better health, or, or for economic development. So I would say that, you know, w w we need to stop fussing over these differences and just get on and support research. But where do we decide, because we, we put a lot of public money into mm -hmm. this, where do we decide the money goes? Do we just let scientists do what they want willy-nilly, or who, who decides? Well, um, I, I think first of all, you know, we we need to uh, support basic uh, research that is, you know, discovery research. People thinking like, you know, Marty just said, okay, I just want to see where the cell is, and if I think that if people had given him money to say, okay, develop a way to um, uh, to, to target cancer cells, he wouldn't have done it. Right. So I think it's we have to have respect for the, for the unknown because if we can predict things well, they're not really original, right? So I think that um, it's difficult to, to guess. Um, on the other hand, um, I take the example in Canada of artificial intelligence. So over 20 and 25 years, there were development in computer sciences, there were development in math, in computing, in all sorts of things. And then uh, suddenly it was, you know, people, got, the, the scientists themselves got together and saw the potential applications. And I think the role of government is to facilitate this and also to de-risk things when, uh, you know, before the private sector embraces, uh, you know, new applications and so on. And Marty, did you want to weigh in on this? How do you decide where the money is best spent? So it, it's my experience, and I, I think if you talk to almost any, any scientist, they will say that the uh, basic understanding uh, it, it led to applications, that, the, that there is a pipeline between under, it, understanding a fundamental principle in biology or physics or chemistry, and then its application in many respects. And to me, it's not really a question of should we have this or should we have that. We have to keep the pipeline going. We want to have the applications. We want people to be thinking about that, but we also want people to be discovering the new things. Um, in, I think, around 2004 in the United States, uh, there was a meeting of a bunch of cancer researchers, and one person gets up, and it was sort of the government official in charge of this and said something that shocked everybody in the room. He said, don't you think we've learned enough biology by now? We can just start <laughs> applying that to work on cancer. Well, all the stuff that's happened since then that we had no clue about 
It just shows how mistaken that idea is, that we have learned enough. The other thing I want to say is there is sometimes a slightly disparaging way of talking about this, where we say it's blue sky research, curiosity driven. They're in their ivory tower. It sort of implies that people who do basic research, one, do it because of their own personal advantage that comes out of this, and two, they don't care about anybody. I think that is the furthest from the truth it could possibly be because every person I know doing basic research, certainly in every grant proposal they write, they are saying, why is their research important? What are the implications of it? And when we write a paper, we've made a discovery, we talk about what we see as the next steps of what's going on and how this could be applied. So I, don't th I think this idea that basic research means no one cares or they're just doing it for their own personal curiosity, I think that's really misguided. I think we're trying to understand about the world. We've had so many different examples to show us that that understanding leads to so many amazing things. That, I think that, as I say, is a misguided idea. We really are producing the elements of the pipeline. And by the way, often, if I may, yeah. what we think will be the application doesn't end up being the application, something else yeah. uh, that is as important or sometimes more important becomes the application. So there's a limit to how much we can predict when we, we still don't know and we're still searching. And Art, how do, you, how do you get politicians, the public, to buy into this notion of investing in research? Well, I think it relates to what was just being yeah. said. Uh, you know, even when you're doing basic research, it's an educational exercise. I mean, here we are at a, at a university that's very typical for where uh, basic research takes place. And the people that you're educating uh, very often don't end up in an academic position. They end up in other positions in uh, industry or in, in government labs. And industry actually needs the people who think in a basic way and who are capable of understanding not only uh, something they developed themselves or something that somebody down on the street in Canada, down the street in Canada developed, but what's happening in Germany or China uh, of a fundamental nature that that company is in an advantageous position to be able to turn into uh, a uh, product that's of value to mankind. And so the educational process, very often based on basic science in universities, is a process that is providing very valuable people for society. About 75% of the people who worked as postdocs and, and, uh, uh, and students on snow, 200 or so of them, uh, ended up in positions other than academic uh, uh, positions and are in a wide variety of things because they learned, as was mentioned earlier on, evidence-based decision-making. But that's Which another stereotype that you're just cranking out more egghead scientists who are going to be professors. Yeah, but that's not, in that's fact, not the reality. Yeah. I think learning how to make decisions based on, seek the evidence and make decisions based on it is important in government, it's important in business, it's important in our lives. So uh, uh, I think the educational process really needs to be considered in all of this as well. And, and Mona, you deal with politicians at a very high level. Uh, now, I know there's an election on, so we can't talk specifics, but generally, <laughs> generally, how, how do you... Is there an election? My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> how do you get this message across that science is important and research is important? Well, I think we need, you know, to, first of all, um, you know, it's... it's uh, if we just talk about science, about discovery in 20 years and everything, it remains abstract, you know, to, to, to most decision makers who basically most of the time have to extinguish fires and have to deal with a lot of things that are important to all of us, right? So I think what's important <coughs> is to, uh, to explain how actually science uh, supports uh, the government agenda and uh, the good of the country. So I think the training aspect, for example, that, um, that are talked about is, uh, is very important and not very well understood uh, either. So everybody's talking about the future of jobs and reskillings and everything. But even the students who are in this, uh, you know, in this audience, in this university, I understand there are some from high schools as up well top, here. Yeah, up top. yeah, a shout to chemistry, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, like these, uh, these uh, young people are going to have, they're going to be in jobs in, in uh, 10, 15, 20 years that don't exist today and that we cannot predict. So I think uh, it's just so important that we are helping actually, you know, government objectives irrespective of the parties for prosperity, economic development and so on. I think the other thing also is uh, when you think about the, the healthcare system, when you think about the environment, um, you know, mitigation and adaptation, it's, uh, these are uh, places where we need new thinking, new technologies, and they're going to come out of you know, science and out of uh, applied sciences, which are technologies. So we short, the scientists in general, we shortchange ourselves because we're, we're, we don't uh, articulate well enough uh, the, the you know, correspondence and the matching between uh, what happens in science and technology and the good of the country. Now, Marty, we've talked uh, in passing many times about young researchers, the importance of them. Well, in a lab like yours, what, what do you look for? There are people here who are going to want jobs. Uh, what do you look for when you're looking for postdocs and PhDs and master's students? And or technicians. Technicians, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I look for a couple of things. Um, one of the most important is honesty. When I, I ask people, that the, the very best people that I like to come in because they all are smart enough. They really are. It's, a, it's quite wonderful. But the, my ideal person is I sit down and I proceed to bore the pants off of them by telling them about our research. And I know I'm going to say something that they will never have heard of. And the ideal person is the one that stops me and says, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me what that is? That's the person I want. Because that person is honest about it, has enough confidence in themselves to admit that they don't know anything and they want to find out about it. And curiosity. And curiosity yeah. about it. And that's a fantastic person to have. I want to know how people get along with one another. Because science is a collaborative uh, enterprise. And I think that's very important. I, when a postdoc applies to my lab, not only do I read those letters, I call up those people and say, how were they with other people? How did they work? How independent are they? How uh, much do they contribute? How much are they helpful for the other people in the lab? Uh, all of these sort of things. So there's a lot of interpersonal skills and everything because these people have already done something. They're already accomplished. I don't have any... I'm not looking for someone that knows how to do this particular type of microscopy or that particular type of reaction. I want to know how they're excited about the science and, as I said, the honesty. I have had people, not for postdoc positions or graduates, but I have had people where I've gotten to that point and I've said, oh, and they don't, they don't uh, stop me. I'll stop them and I'll say, oh, do you know what this is? Sometimes they know it, and I have to keep going. But every <laughs> once in a while, there will be someone that will say, oh, yeah, I know that. And then I'll say, OK, tell me what it is. And they were trying to please me. They're gone. I'm sorry. That, so th I think the honesty in science is something we really uh, respect and, and uh, deem as essential to the work is, to me, a very important thing. But I also want to see how they interact with people. Art, I see you nodding. Do you, do you have more to add? What do you look for? No, I think that's, uh, that's very correct, uh, uh, particularly in our case where we're working in large collaborations. The ability to work with other people is very important. Curiosity, is, uh, which you mentioned and brought into the, to the discussion, is, uh, has got to be a central driving force. Uh, you need to have people that, uh, that want to find an answer to the things that they're working on. Uh, and, uh, of course, technical skills are, are, are important, uh, but, of course, theoretical skills are important as well. It's a, typically a, uh, it's very, very unusual that you find both of those uh, qualities in, uh, in one person, but if you do, that's a very valuable person. So I agree completely with what Marty said. Can I so, add one more quality? Yes. Mm -hmm. Passion? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think you have to love what you're doing because uh, there are lots of ups and downs. And when we talk, I, yeah, I, I yeah, just yeah, want to jump in. I want to jump in because this passion <laughs> problem is, is, is one that I think about a lot, especially for undergraduates. We seem to say to undergraduates, 
follow your passion as if we're saying something good to them. <laughs> I think all we're saying to them is, I, I think all they're thinking about when we say that it is, oh my what's God. my passion? <laughs> yeah. Tell me and I'll do yeah. it because I haven't figured it out. <laughs> and what if I make a mistake and I pick the wrong thing? So yes, it's really good to be passionate about things, but I personally yeah. don't like this thing of follow your passion because I find it sort of rare. Certainly I didn't know what my passion was until it sort of appeared in front of me and the experiment worked. Uh, no, I, I agree with you and I often get asked the sort of question, how, do I, how should I choose a career? And I usually say something that's pretty simple and maybe obvious, but uh, uh, what are the things, think about what the things are that you would find enjoyable to get up in the morning and go and do? What are the various areas that would be fun, that you could be passionate about? And then go and try a few of them and see what you're good at. Because it's the combination of that, get up in the morning and have fun, and science really can be fun, uh, as we've both experienced, we've all experienced. Um, and at the same time, you have to recognize your own talents. And the combination of the two helps, I think. Now, when we talk about hiring, when we talk about the future of science, we can't avoid talking about there's a big gender gap in science. So we attract, we're attracting more and more young women to science, but it's real problems with retention, with them moving up into uh, positions of power. How, how do we address that? Uh, Mona, maybe you could start. Well, you know, this is a very important uh, question and uh, an important problem uh, for society on many, many fronts. Uh, if I take the, the gender, for example, gap in, in science, um, I, you know, the, the present, not even the future, requires science and technologies. And if women are not in these fields, then they're just like not getting, you know, equal opportunity at prosperity. And uh, we all know what happens after with their, with their kids and, and so on. But uh, the, the, the other um, question is, uh, do we have a one-size-fits-all to bring in more women and more underrepresented people in, into sciences? And I think uh, we need to be very careful uh, in, in, uh, because the problems are at different places. So I think at the level, for example, of the life sciences, we don't have a problem convincing uh, girls and women to go into undergraduate, graduate, and even postdocs. And then we're having problems recruiting them into uh, key positions and advancing them. So the problem is at the level really of advancing the, the career and perhaps the environment. If I take the case of physics, for example, or, or computer science or, or, or mathematics, which are so important for the future, well, we have a problem with the pool because we don't have at the level of undergraduate student, we're less than 30% in these fields. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see how we're going to be able you know, to move the needle. And uh, I think, Marty, you shared with us that um, those uh, really scary statistics that at the pace of change, uh, it's going to take us 150 years, I think, to catch up to the gender gap in, uh, in physics. Uh, astrophysics would be 300 years and then <laughs> so don't even try. So I think that there has been progress but we need to think carefully about uh, what do we do at, at various levels, at the level of the pool, at the level of um, the career path and at the level after that of leadership. I think in astrophysics it's going to take 300 light years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now Marty, you, you, we've talked about this uh, earlier but what, what can old white guys like us do about this? How could we help solve the problem? I think one of the things is recognizing there's a problem. I think there are a number of ways that people have addressed it. I uh, was a past president of the Society for Developmental Biology, and one thing that I uh, really admired about the group that happened way before I was asked to run for this is they made a decision maybe about 20, 25 years ago there was always two people that ran for the president of the society. And they decided, we're gonna alternate each year. Two men, two women. Two men, two women. They now have this large body of people with exceptional uh, accomplishments and exceptional experience at being the leader of this thing that has 50-50 parity. So I think there are organizational things that can be done to decide. And it wasn't, you know, these 
talented people were already there. They were already in, in the field. They weren't given the opportunity to do this. And then the society said, oh, we're going to do this. So I think there are some things that can be done. I think people should pay attention. Uh, the American Society for Cell Biology had a very active committee uh, uh, headed by Sandy Mazur uh, called Women in Cell Biology. And they realized there were all these important meetings that were happening. And overwhelmingly, the people asked to talk were men. And they just proceeded to say, do you know, in your field, and then listed all the accomplished women that were in the field, and that was sent out to everyone. All of a sudden, those meetings changed the balance so because people had worked on it. So I think there are things that one can do. There is an enormous amount left to do. There's no question about that. My own department, I came to Columbia in the biolo biological sciences in 1982 and counting associated uh, faculty from, our, one of, uh, from Barnard College, which is a women's college, we had 25% women in our faculty. Today, we have more faculty members. The percentage of women is, I think, 28%. Not a lot of progress in all that time. There have been many people through it, and, and, and you, know, you can say, oh, it's a small N or whatever. But it really is something that we have to, I think, address in every level. I saw some research published this morning on your point that uh, said 40% of all panels at scientific conferences were men only. So there's this movement on Twitter, no more manals, which uh, I encourage people to, if you see a panel with no women, to send out a photo and embarrass people into thinking about it, if nothing else. So I want to go to audience questions, because I know there's a lot of people keen to ask questions. Uh, there are a few people roaming around with mics. Uh, there's someone here right at the front, if there's a mic coming. And uh, we're going to set you to the wolves of the panelists. That was the fastest hand raising I've seen in history. <laughs> very, very good. Hello. Um, my name is Jennifer. I'm an undergraduate student. And I used green fluorescent protein in a microscopy experiment this morning. So thank you very much for your discovery. <laughs> My question is related to something you touched on earlier. I have no idea what I want to do with my life. How do you deal with that feeling of uncertainty? Uncertainty about further education, uncertainty about career paths, uncertainty about how I'm going to spend the next 50 years of my life. So I, I think, and I can only talk for myself, I think that it, it was important for me to realize that it's not this, I'm making a decision and I'm doomed from that decision point on. I think we have lots of uh, <coughs> opportunities. The opportunities come at other times. There's lots of good reasons uh, that have been talked about here of, of why one gets a PhD and how that trains one to think about things. Uh, there, it, it's not that the path is, is, is is lost by taking another path. I, so I think that part of it is this feeling of a friend that once referred to graduation from college as entering that period of infinite summer vacation. Uh, <laughs> you, you're sort of, you know, you've fallen off a cliff. <laughs> what are you going to do at that point? I, I well, think move it into is your parents' basement. That's a <laughs> perfectly fine. I think. I think the thing is. It's the involvement, as has been said before, to that, that brings you things. If you find, you know, we're talking at two different ends of the age scale here, <laughs> you realize that. Uh, if you find that after a year of trying something, it's really horrible, you're pretty young. <laughs> you, you have a chance to do things. And in fact, many people, and you ask us about our research and what we've worked on, in the past, you'll see that the people here on the stage have had several careers, several different things that they've done as things change in their life. Uh, and, and so I don't think it's that, you, I th don't think you've come to the cliff. Thank you. Thank you. I can't see very late with the, I, they told me there's a mic upstairs, is there a question upstairs? No, uh, over here, yeah, okay. I think there was someone at the back as well. 
Yeah, if the people with their mic could raise their hand, I could maybe see them better. So, yep. Uh, hi, I'm Adam. I'm an undergraduate here. Um, so since surely you need a certain set of paradigms to uh, think the way that nobody else more or less has thought before or come to a conclusion nobody else has come to, uh, what inspired you to think the way that you think and how did you, or sorry, like, or what uh, philosophers, maybe uh, previously um, successful scientists, uh, who inspired you and what led you to seek out their inspirations? Well, we, uh, the, the, the research we did to win the Nobel Prize, we were solving a problem in science, which could have been because we didn't understand how the sun burns, or it could be because we had to change the laws of physics in a substantial way. Um, and fortunately, I, I was very lucky to have a, a group of like-minded uh, individuals uh, crossing a number of countries and, and numbering at any given point about 130, although we started with about 16, who thought this was a great scientific problem to spend a fair amount of time on, and, and, and it took over 20 years from the very beginning until we really had finished the experiment. But it was substantial enough in either case to be something to devote effort to, and it took a lot of effort. But it was an outstanding problem in science that we had, as it happens, the capability here in Canada, uh, availability of a large amount of heavy water and an underground site, to do it. And uh, therefore, we seized an opportunity and proceeded to do it. Uh, that was a rather unique situation where there was a problem to be solved and we potentially had the resources. Uh, maybe Marty can, can give a, or Mona can give a, a, a rather broader answer. Uh, that happened to be the case of what I was working on. Well, I can just say that, uh, you know, it, it's, it, there are no huge eureka moments, perhaps, or, or, you know, like stress about thinking differently, but very often also about not being bound by the uh, by what's known and what people tell you is possible or not possible. And I'll give you a very specific example of my own research. I started working on the heart, actually, thanks to a discovery that was done here at Queen's University by Professor Adolfo de Bol, who discovered a hormone that comes out of the heart, and I did the cloning and started to get interested in it. I, I was a chemist. I had no clue about any other organ. And I realized uh, then that the... Uh, the, the folks who were interested in understanding how the heart function was taking skeletal muscle as an example. So there were more advances there and everybody was trying to look for the same proteins in the heart that exist in skeletal muscle. I didn't know that. So I looked at my genes and actually they looked more like genes that you would find in blood cells. So I looked at what's important in blood cells and said, oh, maybe it's the same thing in the heart. So. It's basically, I had no a priori, we changed the, the paradigm actually about you know, the, the heart function and so on, but um, it's, and this is where I think interdisciplinarity and, and going from one field to the other is very often important because you just don't have any a priori. So I would say maybe two things. The, the first is that uh, I feel that in my undergraduate training, one of the very best things that prepared me to be a scientist were my social science and humanities courses. And the reason for that is the exams, I had to learn a lot of material, remember a lot of material, but the questions had never been spoken in class. They had never been part of what I'd read. It was synthesize all the stuff that you've learned in a new and different way to answer this question. I think that's terrific training for these things, is, is to do that. And I find that for myself, a lot of times I'll be reading something and I'll remember something else. Or when I had the discovery about GFP, I was listening to a seminar and somebody mentioned this wonderful molecule and I had, all, I had this transparent animal that I wanted to know where the genes were. It's those making those connections that bring these things. Often, for me, it's talking with people. 
just saying the problem often gives me or them an insight into how to approach it. So maybe I should stop there and continue on. Because I, I think there are ways of, of making these connections. I don't know what, I, let me add one other horrible story. I'm sorry. Um, when I was a graduate student, I, I, I think one of the things is we don't observe what's right in front of us. And that's one of the problems. So I think part of it is an approach is try to really think about what you have. So I'm going to ruin all of your lives by giving you the example. <laughs> this, one of the professors would teach about muscle. And this is always in about October in the US. And he would talk about muscle and he'd say, you know, there's fast twitch muscle, which only has to work a little bit, but very quickly. And then the other type of skeletal muscle is slow twitch. And that has to work over a long period of time for posture, things like that. And so that needs a source of oxygen. It has something like the hemoglobin in blood called myoglobin. And by this time, all the students were asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and then he hit him. He hit them with this. He said, and that's why when you go home for Thanksgiving dinner, now you can tell your parents the difference between the light meat and the dark meat. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, I have now ruined all of your lives because the next time you have chicken or turkey, you're going to think about that. <laughs> but it was right in front of you, and I have never met anyone who said to themselves, I wonder why, what's different about light meat and dark meat and chicken? Everyone's had chicken, everyone's seen it, but to ask the question about it, that's the hard part. And that's a good anecdote. Canadian uh, Thanksgiving is very soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nope. right. And if you have a question up top, wave because I can't see you very well. Yes, oh, down here. Hi, Andre. Um, I'm Tim Lougheed. I'm the editor of Canadian Chemical News. Um, I've long marveled at the huge portion of the population that is utterly unqualified for playing a sport or in entering politics that is, are nevertheless totally engaged in these pursuits as spectators, as fans, as wonks, and can't seem to digest enough information about it. But that if you put matters of science in front of that same proportion of the population, they want to treat it as a black box. It's over their head. And it probably goes back to an experience like you had in the lab, where they just fled. But my question to you is, how do we encourage that same sort of wonkery in the entire population, that literacy, that desire to know more about this, even if you don't play the sport? Can I just, maybe I'll, yeah. I'll start. Um, I think the last, uh, the last uh, survey that was uh, published, uh, I believe two days ago or yesterday, about uh, science literacy and uh, you know, how much the, the public wants to know about science and so on, has actually good, good news and a bit of discouraging news. The good news is actually the public is interested in hearing more about science. Um, the, the, the bad news is, you know, whether they trust science and whether, you know, but I think 80 or 90 percent of them wanted more scientists to engage with the public. So I think that we have a lot of work uh, to do ahead of us. And uh, I, was, uh, I, I was watching a small video clip of uh, Cédric Villani, a fields medalist, a mathematician in France who's now running for the mayor of Paris. And he said that, uh, and uh, Andre is probably better than me at commenting on this, but I'll say what he said. Said, the, the, you, you know, now as a, as a politician, I ha when I ask me a question, I have to give the answer first and then explain why. As, as researchers and scientists, we have to go through all the explanation and then give the conclusion. Well, we've lost people. So I think that, you know, there are things that we need to learn to do, and I think that we need to every single scientist and researcher has to feel a responsibility to engage with the public because what we do is a public good and we get taxpayers' money to do, to do the research and we're doing it you know, to, to give back. So I think it, it dawned upon us to learn maybe how to engage with, with, with society. And art, uh, part of winning a Nobel Prize is it has, it's a great honor, but it comes with great responsibility and part of it is this no. interaction, right? Yeah, um, I'm sure 
Marty would agree, there is a tremendous responsibility associated with it. Um, I'm encouraged because uh, science and technology is becoming so important in our lives. It's becoming so much a part of, uh, uh, of what happens tomorrow to us. Uh, you know, I think the, the public is interested in a, a wide variety of things that would have been, you know, would not have been uh, thought of uh, in the past, and, and it's engaging people in the topic. Driverless cars, for example. Uh, artificial intelligence. How do you get a morality into artificial intelligence such that if you really let something uh, go ahead and, and have uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to do things in your society, how is that thing going to act? Uh, climate change. Uh, there, there is a, a tremendous interest in the general public in a wide variety of things because it's in their lives now. And so I think that's uh, uh, putting a greater onus on the scientists who do know what the background is in detail uh, to provide the answers when asked. And uh, hopefully, uh, because it is something that's going to affect you tomorrow or today, uh, the, scient the, the, the general public will get more interested in science and technology and, and, uh, and the background to it as we go forward. So I'm going to be the pessimist. Um, Come on, you can do this. Uh, I, I think this is half the, half the issue. I think that there certainly is a need for more explanation, more uh, understanding about what we do. But I think we cannot avoid the problem that we're seeing, unfortunately, all too often, where governments, politicians, I'm sure I can come up with one or two <laughs> in my mind, uh, do not use evidence as the basis of decisions. So it's not, not getting the information, not understanding the information, it's ignoring the information. I think this is a problem. I think it's a problem not even for governments. I think this is a problem in general because we have vast amounts of information at our fingertips. I think people probably all over the world, now when they go to their doctor and their doctor prescribes a, a medicine, they go online, they scare themselves to death at looking at all the side effects. They imagine that this side effect that's going to affect one out of 20,000 people is going to affect them. And then they say, well, no, I don't, won't trust my doctor. My doctor didn't tell me about this problem. I, and and they, they, they're treating themselves. I think there's a real problem about how one utilizes evidence, how it's used in terms of our own health, in terms of government activity. That, I think, is a very big issue for all of us of how we train ourselves, how we train others to look realistically at the information in addition to actually presenting them with the information. But, Marty, wouldn't you say that you know, if the public put, put uh, you know, pr uh, the pressure and if it was the public's expectation that politicians are going to use evidence in decision-making, you know, wouldn't you think that would put pressure on, on, the, on the politicians to, to, to try at least and, and, and use evidence? One and that's would what, hope. Yeah, and, and, but that's, <laughs> that's why I think, you know, the, the public um, uh, outreach and so on is extremely important because public has to appreciate after that what's, what's going to happen, you know, if, if you're not using the evidence and so on. And Marty, what's, what's the role of the media to, to continue yeah. with Tim's analogy? We have entire sports sections, sports bulletins, sports channels. And you don't see a lot of science in the mainstream media. Is the media to blame for some of this illiteracy? I, I think that there's a problem of overhyping things. You know, every, everything is a cure for cancer. Everything is a cure for the, this disease or that disease or this is a big discovery. I, most scientific discoveries are actually small steps in what is a very large number of step process that actually gives you maybe what you want. Um, and so part of it is how do you make something interesting that is exciting to the person who's done it and they have made a real breakthrough, but I think we sometimes try in, in the media, I think it, it's sometimes how can we take this piece of information and make it exciting to these people, as opposed to what is exciting about this information? And, it, it, and I, so I do think there's a, an element of that, of, of not really describing the whole thing. I, I, 
I, I every, periodically I try to uh, try to. I have an idea that I'd like a, a screenwriter to use for a play, and 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 it is of of someone who discovers that. Uh, a member of their family has a disease and they change their lab around to try to find what the basis of that disease was. And they find it and they get awards and they are honored for the great science that they did, but it doesn't save the relative because just discovering the beginning of the path doesn't always do that. I think that's a realistic way of looking at science. It may not be the most encouraging or uplifting <laughs> aspect of it, but we, we are making small steps and those small steps add up. But uh, the, the, I think that narrative is a little hard for someone to accept, but I, I think it, it, it's more realistic. So I think, there is a thing, universities love to tout the great discoveries that they've done, and so we've cured so many things <laughs> from all these universities. Not quite yet, but we're getting there. That's the important thing. We're, we're, we're approaching these things. So yes, I think sometime the attempt of how we think we should explain things to people is, is a little problematic. And have you pitched your screenplay to Ang Lee? No, I okay. haven't met Ang Lee. I do know Ang Lee's screenwriter, or at okay. least, well, and he's not interested. Uh, <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm looking for up top. Yep. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ethan, and uh, my question is: At what point did you realize that your research was worthy of a Nobel Prize? And also, what do you think sets you apart from other researchers doing work in your field? Did you hear that, Art? No. Uh, when when could, did you know could you your, say it again, somewhat yeah. louder, please? When oh. did you know your research was worthy of a Nobel Prize? Was the first question. That's um, easy. One. Well, we had. Uh, first of all, I, I think our scientific collaboration um, is very satisfied and, and overjoyed to have received a Nobel Prize for the work that we did. But in point of fact, there was a day back in, in uh, uh, 2001 and another in 2002 with greater accuracy, where all at the same time, uh, the collaboration realized that we had made a major scientific discovery. And this is because as we were analyzing this very sparse data that we obtained, uh, one neutrino an hour over a number of years, uh, we uh, blinded ourselves as we were doing the analysis. And then on one day, we removed that blindness, removed uh, false data we had put in that uh, prevented people from following their nose to a conclusion. And so everybody in front of their computer on the same day at the same time realized what the answer was. And the answer was we had made a major scientific discovery, neutrino properties. We had discovered the first bit of, neutrino, first bit of science that went beyond uh, the standard model of particle physics in a very, very clear way. And so that day was the day that the scientists working on the project got the satisfaction for all their years of work. The Nobel Prize, in addition to that, and, and there were a number of my colleagues that came to, to Stockholm with me and we had a wonderful party, it's an incredible <laughs> time. Uh, we're very pleased to be uh, a part of a Nobel Prize, but the Nobel Prize is the icing on the cake. The satisfaction comes from uh, the discovery in the first place and the recognition that, that, the, uh, that, the, that the project and that an individual like me who tries to represent the others well uh, gets is, is not what you set out to do, you set out to do the science. You know it's good, you hope perhaps that it will be considered by a committee like the Nobel uh, committee to be worthy, uh, but it really was that day back in when we made the discovery that uh, everything uh, uh, came together for the people who worked so hard. And Marty, when did you know? Uh, I think the, the morning that I woke up, I, I had missed the phone call. <laughs> uh, and I, I woke up well after if there had been, people periodically if they like your work, they will tell you, we think this might be worthy enough of getting a prize, but no one's listening to them. So you don't <laughs> really get an idea that, that's the, that, that somehow they have a line to Stockholm. Uh, and anyway, I woke up in the morning, and it was after six o'clock, and I know in the 
when the prize is going to be announced. So I wondered who it was that got the prize. And I looked online, and I saw my name. And it's just really quite wonderful. Uh, I, I, I've told several people this, that I, I did go back periodically over the next couple of weeks to see if my name was still there. And, and it was. Uh, it was, so it was, it, was, it was very nice. But, uh, you know, there's so much good science. There's so many things that people have done that no one has a lock on the prize. Or very, right. very few people have a lock on the prize. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was, a, I, I think, a wonderful prize in medicine <coughs> physiology uh, for uh, people, uh, one in China, couple others elsewhere, discovering drugs for malaria, or to finding drugs against nematode parasites, uh, filarial parasites. Wonderful, wonderful recognition for, for work that was not what everyone would have had on their list of what was the Nobel. There's a lot of spectacular stuff that's done out there. And so every year, and week or so, we're going to find out the next round of people. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be surprised at who the people are that are, are, are honored. So no one, as I say, has a lock on it. They're not going to get it for sure. But yes, it's very nice when a friend says to you, I think you, you might get this. The downside of that is if you're an idiot, you stay up one or two nights waiting for the phone call and it does not come. So uh, you have to beware of that. Okay. So we're almost out of time. So I want to ask each of you to send our audience home. We're here to send a hopeful message about the future of science. So I want you to end with a, a couple of inspiring words, if you could, especially for the younger people in the audience about why should they be hopeful of a career in science and why they should pursue this route. Uh, well, everybody's sorry, pointing, pointing to you, Mona. So well, I, <laughs> well, first of all, I, I'm uplifted when I look at the audience and there are so many young people. I think this is fantastic. And as you can tell, uh, in a few years when you're going to finish your studies, we're, we're going to be retired. So there's going to be a lot of jobs out there, both in university, government, and everywhere else. I'm looking at uh, the many, many um, you know, female that are in, in the audience. And uh, I want you to know that uh, uh, there is a place for you in whatever you decide you want to do in, in science, technology, or, or engineering. Uh, I think that women have a lot to contribute, and uh, the world is waiting for you. So just don't let anyone stop you. I, I agree. I have eight granddaughters, including, I'm told, a one-year-old, Bella, who is watching today. So you better weigh it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, uh, particularly in physics, uh, uh, as many of us feel that there, there really needs to be uh, uh, a, a revolution in the uh, participation of women in the, in the, uh, in the science. And uh, I'm hopeful that we're able to uh, uh, interest people and uh, maintain their careers through the, through the field as we go forward. But, but my bottom line is science is fun. It really is. It's an adventure. An, an adventure. And uh, you can have just a wonderful career in applied science or basic science. And uh, uh, so uh, embrace it. Uh, in terms of you're in a university, a university gives you a chance to try a variety of things. See what works for you. And uh, it's fun. It's the bottom line. You can really enjoy it. And Marty? So I have two things. The first is that getting ahead in science really isn't who you know. It really is what you've done. It's your accomplishments. It's your thoughts. And I find that exciting because you merit the advances that you get. Uh, and, and I think that's a very good thing. The other idea that I've had is that we often talk about the golden age of cinema or the golden age of theater or music or you know, some time in the past where there were really amazing people and amazing things to be done. And I realized a couple of years ago, we are always right now in the golden age of science. We are always right now with more opportunities, more possibilities than anyone in the past. So this is the time. And so to 
say in a slightly different way what Mona said before, you have three very envious people on this stage yeah. because of all the things that you're going to do and you're going to see as we go forward in this. It's a very exciting time. Wonderful. So I want to invite uh, Barbara Crow up to give us some uh, final send-off. And while she's making her way to the stage, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. So thank you. So I'm in charge of concluding and thanking our panelists. And uh, Mr. Picard, I do like your socks. <laughs> you have a good view of them. Uh, but I am really thrilled to be concluding this as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science, because I truly believe it is the arts and science and having a range of pr perspectives that makes us better and more curious and facilitates. And what I really wanted to speak about was uh, something you've all talked about, failure, persistence, but joy and the importance of joy in our work. And you talked about many of the uh, factors that go into and that are part of joy. Changing the way, discovering, mentoring, asking questions, converging, facilitating, persisting uh, that we saw, and uh, translating, collaborating. These are all really important. So it's not only for us having a diversity in representation, it's really important to have a diversity in perspectives in what we do, and it was really wonderful to hear uh, your perspectives, uh, your journeys, and for those of us who uh, truly love being here in the university and what's possible, uh, to be part of that and that our institution plays a role in that. So, so thank you very much. So. Thank you to our panels, to Dr. McDonald, Dr. Niemer, and special guest, uh, Dr. Chelfi. Uh, your experiences and wisdom um, have been inspirational for us in the audience today. And I'd like to thank you, Mr. Picard, for facilitating this discussion, a really important journalist for science in Canada. He's been amazing at what he's been able to bring and the legitimacy and the work that you've done. To <laughs> The media is important, and we know how important it is to have them, and that is to thank our Queen's communication team who've done a fantastic job putting this together and demonstrating Queen's is the place for the Nobel laureates and for us to be having these conversations. And I'd like to thank those who've joined us online and for those of you who have come here today and to let you know that you will be able to speak to our panelists, there's going to be a reception and selfies and a photographer and everything. <laughs> so you are to see, meet them out in the reception, not on stage, because uh, they'll be ushered out. And before I go, we have a small gift of appreciation for you. Okay, on the other side of the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, so may I now uh, ask you to proceed to the uh, reception? That was wonderful.